Hey watch friends, today we're going to check out the latest prototype from the micro brand MMI. This is part of their turret series and this is the turret GMT. This one as of time of publishing is already actually live on their website and I'll of course have a link down in the video description. If you are planning on picking one up, I encourage you to act quickly because the launch pricing ends on March 15th of 2024. So it's launching on this bracelet at uh, $369. You can save 20 bucks if you want to get it on a rubber strap without bracelet at $349. So with that, let's go ahead and get a feel for this and see if it's one you're interested in picking up. For the basic specs, it comes standard with a one-year warranty. The case measured from roughly the 2 o'clock to 8 o'clock is coming in at 39.9 millimeters, so right at 40. The bezel is pretty much flush. I got 39.8 millimeters, so essentially flush with the, uh, the case there. The lugs are a strap change friendly 22 millimeters. The lug to lug is coming in at 47 millimeters. The total thickness is coming in at 13.6 millimeters, which doesn't sound terribly thick for a dive style watch, but we'll talk about that a little more because this slab construction, as well as the thicker case back, I do think makes it wear a little bit thicker than the specs denote. The crystal is a flat sapphire crystal and it does feature inner AR coating. The movement has this beating away with a Seiko NH34. For those who aren't familiar, it's going to be essentially an NH35 with an added GMT hand. So you're going to have all the things you'd expect there. It's going to be automatic, hacking, hand winding, lower beat, around 40 hour, uh, 38, 40 hour uh, power reserve, all that kind of good stuff. As far as the water resistance, with being a dive style watch, as you'd expect, it has a pretty solid water resistance coming in at 300 meters or 30 atmospheres. The weight, sized my six and a half inch wrist, is coming in at 158 grams. So with that, with having those links uh, taken out of there, definitely not a real light one. So this is one, as we'll talk about, it is definitely on the stout kind of diver uh, styling there. So with the basic specs out of the way, let's go ahead and dive deeper and get a better feel for this one. This is going to be available in three color variants. There is the yellow or orangish yellow that we're looking at today. There's additionally a black version and a blue version. Both the orange and the blue or yellow and blue, as we'll see, are actually full loom dials as well. As far as the finish on this particular one, it's what I would describe as kind of like a satiny sherbet color. You know, it's certainly not quite as orange as an orange sherbet would be, but it really puts me in mind of that. And I do think this finally walks the line between an orange and a yellow. It's definitely an orangish yellow or a yellowish orange, whichever way you want to go with it. One of the biggest things that you're going to notice on this as part of what is a signature for the turret series is going to be that skeletonized cutout in the middle. What that's going to be is that is a pointer date kind of function. So there's a little hand down in there, a little disc uh, down in there that gives you a red accent. We'll talk about that further as we go through with that color choice. There is going to be printing on the dial. You can see their logo at the 12 o'clock position as well as GMT and the water uh, resistance down at the six o'clock position. And then of course you have your labeling for your date. And then as you move further out, you can see that this has a printed chapter ring as well. That printed chapter ring is going to have a couple things going on. You have a one fifth scale for telling for your minutes and seconds. But then additionally, as you move in, when you see the numerals there, that's going to be your 24 hour numerals. So in keeping with the GMT styling. As far as the hardware, this has what I would describe as what we've seen a lot lately, and that is a modifying Dauphine handset. You can see that this is polished, and it has kind of a cathedral embellishment. I say modified Dauphine because while it does have the crease in some of the typical accents there, you're going to have blunted tips, and it's going to be an atypical kind of construction for uh, the overall layout. As far as the second hand, just a very delicate second hand, and you can see it does have a color accent tip, but again, we'll talk about that further as we go through, with just not being overly prominent against this, uh, this orangish dial. Shifting over to the loom, this one, as I mentioned, is a full loom dial. You're going to see the dial itself, I mean, it glows like an absolute torch, but then you additionally have loom on your handset, as well as your markers, and the bezel, and even the crown that we'll check out here momentarily. Across lighting conditions, one of the things that's really neat is because of this full loom dial and with having that vibrant orange-yellow color, you actually see that transition as you shift the lighting across. It really kind of stays looking largely the same day or night, which is a pretty slick function. And then the crown, just kind of an interesting and always fun little, uh, little touch there. Definitely a novelty, but it's something that I appreciate. Shifting over to the bezel, this one is going to be what they would describe as like a dive GMT. So in keeping with that, it does have a dive style bezel, not a 12 hour or 24 hour uh, bezel for uh, the GMT. So in with that uh, insert, this is a 120 click unidirectional and we'll check out the action here momentarily. It has a coin edge 
for its construction. As you can see, the bezel is actually nested into the case. So we'll look at this further as we unpack the case, but you can see lugs come up and actually encapsulate that a little bit, almost like a crown guard, which is kind of an interesting accent and touch there. So it keeps you from bumping uh, the, uh, the bezel, which we'll get back to that here momentarily as well. As far as the insert, this, as you can see, is a sloped insert, and this is a polished ceramic. As we already mentioned, it does have a traditional dives type configuration for the, uh, the markers and indicators there. And you can see the first 20 minutes are going to have your individual hashes. Some do 15, some do 20. I'm personally probably partial to the 15, uh, but 20 is just fine as well. As far as the action, let's go ahead and take a listen to that. As you can hear, pretty solid tactile click. It does, though, as you can see there, it... This isn't the first time it's done it to me. It tends to bind up, so it actually is getting caught. I'm not sure if this has a faulty leaf spring or not, and this might be completely locked up this time. I'm sure I can fight this uh, loose off camera. There we go. Yeah, for whatever reason, it seems to uh, to do that. I expect that that's kind of a one-off issue with this particular prototype. Now I'm beating up the camera as we try to get it going here. But one of the biggest things, though, that I did notice with this, and this is definitely something that needs to be cleaned up on uh, the uh, production version, is there's a fair amount of play. Check out that wiggle that we've got going back and forth in the bezel. I'm not real thrilled with that. That's definitely something that needs to be tightened up. And then plus, like I said, that's probably just a leaf spring issue on this particular version. But as you saw, it does bind up pretty considerably. That being said, it also though, as you can see, has a fairly thin edge to that. So trying to grip ahead of with a hold of that rather with the flush uh, to the case construction, relatively thin edge there. And then of course, having those guards where you can't naturally spin that around. It is not the easiest bezel in the world to manipulate. It's not nearly as hard as it seemed there. Um, however, it is definitely something that is worth pointing out. And we'll talk about that further as we uh, conclude things. As far as the case, this has a basic slab construction for the case. So this is one of the things that I talked about at the outset here for the overall perceived thickness. With having this slab kind of construction as well as the thicker case back, I do think that that tends to thicken this up as far as the visual perception. They didn't have anything as far as the rounding or chamfer cuts or even uh, kind of milling in for, uh, for the lugs there to really visually break that up. And accordingly, I do think it wears and looks a little bit thicker than the basic specs would denote. It has vertical brushing running the uh, the length of that. I'm personally partial to horizontal brushing, but it doesn't look bad, and that's going to be down to preference there. As far as some interesting touches with this, uh, it does have a downturn for uh, for the lugs, but you, as you can see, it does sit proud of that case back. The more interesting notes, though, is as we already looked at, you can see where this cuts up for the lugs, and that encapsulates the bezel. That's something you don't see very commonly. Additionally, it incorporates a compound angle there, so you can see that has the angle cuts as you work down, reminiscent of kind of like a Zello swordfish uh, in that overall silhouette and profile there. As you move over to the lugs themselves, you can see that this compound cut, so you have the chamfer um, cut at the top, that actually carries over to the inside of the lugs as well, which is, I think, visually a nice little touch there, though it does make for some interesting light play where sometimes I'll look at this and actually think the end link or the bracelet is popped loose, but it's just the reflectivity there. Over on the three o'clock side, you can see this does have integrated crown guards, again, in keeping with the dive styling, no problems in accessing that. As far as the crown itself, this is coming in at 6.8 millimeters. In keeping with the dive styling, it is a screw-in construction. The finishing on that is going to be consistent with the bezel, and you can see it does have a coin edge there. And then as we already saw, it is signed with loom applied as well. Shifting over to the case back, this case back, as you'd expect for a dive style watch, is a screw-in construction. The finishing on it is going to be circular brushing across the, uh, the distance there, with the exception of the etching, which is kind of blast. Uh, blasted. It does have milled in there with their logo as well as the text as you work your way around. As we saw from the uh, prior footage and I have discussed it as well, this is a little bit on the thicker side to me and part of that is due to the movement and we'll check out a comparison here momentarily so you can get another idea of a um, NH34 uh, as to how that stacks up. As far as the bracelet, Size to my six and a half inch wrist, you can see I think this fits plenty respectively. It does wear, I think, a little larger than a 40. To me, this actually wears almost like a 41 or a 42, at least visually. And I think part of that is because this is a fairly stout overall kind of toolish watch. But helping that, it does have female end links, so it has a nice, uh, nice uh, drop in articulation as we'll look at here momentarily. Additionally, it does have relatively short H links, and it is going to be a full brush, again, in keeping with that tool style. So there's no, uh, no uh, polish accents to, uh, to break that up. 
This is held in with screws, and they are actually the largest screws that I have ever encountered in sizing a, a bracelet. So it makes them very easy to grip a hold of, and you can actually fit a larger screwdriver than you typically could. And I'll have a link if you need help on sizing those. If you don't already have one, definitely do pick up a good quality screwdriver as well as some Loctite to make sure you keep that, uh, that uh, intact there. As far as the articulation, you know, it's, it's pretty good. It's not uh, not the best in the world. It reminds me um, of uh, a typical uh, three-link or oyster uh, type construction despite the fact that this is an H-link. So it has a decent drop overall, decent drape, does go relatively flush to, uh, to the case back. So you can't complain there. Not the most articulating in the world, but plenty comfortable. As far as the clasp, this is going to be a pretty traditional clasp setup. So you have a basic fold over, then you have a double pusher. It is again going to be uh, principally uh, full brushing uh, all the way around does have their signature you open it up you have a mill bridge and then additionally you do have micro adjust holes traditional micro adjust holes on the side with uh, five of, uh, of those all right so now that we have all that out of the way let's go ahead and bring in some comparisons and oh, actually, I forgot. Um, I do have some uh, Artem uh, in case you wanted to see this, what this looks like on a strap. Um, I didn't throw it on rubber, um, but this just gives you an idea here with the Artem sailcloth uh, strap as well to, as to how that uh, visually can stack up on wrist. All right, now, uh, now that we have that, let's go ahead and shift over and check out some comps. First, we have it next uh, next to a Zelos Black Tip GMT. This is another NH34 powered GMT. So you can get an idea here as far as kind of sizing and scale. This one, I believe, is stated as 41. And as you can see visually, I think these are fairly comparable to the two. But then checking out the profiles here, you can see two just very different ways of hiding the thickness that is inherent to the NH series and specifically the 34 movement. You can see very different where the Zelos went with a really thin mid case. This went with a thicker mid case, relatively thick case backs on both, and then a much taller um, undercut bezel on the Zelos. Next up, here it is next to a 42. This is the Revelot Hex Mariner in the 42 size. Again, when you put this, I mean, with dial presence and otherwise, this has certainly a thicker bezel to it. Both of them, though, are going to be relatively angular uh, kind of construction for that. But you can see visually, I think this has every bit the presence of the Revelot um, and actually then some when it comes to the dial. So that gives you an idea next to a 42. And then finally, splitting the difference here, this is a uh, Wise. This is a, a 41 uh, for, uh, for this one, I believe. Uh, as well. So that just gives you an idea there. Again, I think a lot of visual presence from uh, from this one, and that is the Wise Hitman. All right, so now that we have all that out of the way, let's go ahead and wrap things up with my view of the positives, some critiques, which we've already touched on as we've gone through, as well as the summary. First, for um, the positives, the pricing on this, I think, is pretty reasonable. You're looking at $369 at launch pricing. I think it gets a little less attractive, or certainly less attractive, at the uh, retail pricing of the $469 for what you're getting. But I think, overall, it's a pretty solid offering. There are some things that we'll talk about here momentarily that I'd expect upwards of, uh, of $400. But at $369, I think it's pretty attractive. As far as um, if you're looking for a tool watch, this thing, as we've already talked about, this feels very stout, very solid on the wrist. So this is one, certainly it is uh, you know a little bit hefty, a little bit on the thicker side, all those kind of things. But if you're looking for a rugged tool watch, this definitely, I think, checks that box. Color, I'm a big fan of, uh, of this color. I think it's very attractive. Like I said, it walks the line between that yellow and the orange. I think it fits the dive styling. And the fact that it's a full loom, it looks really cool, whether it's daytime or nighttime. And then the finishing, I think it's pretty solid for the price, especially being a prototype. At sub $400, I think the finishing is respectable. There's nothing that's uh, that's completely remarkable or stand out here where I say it's just absolutely a stunner as far as the finishing. But I think overall, if they can clean up particularly that bezel that we'll talk about again here momentarily, I think this is in pretty good shape. As far as the bezel um, in the critiques, I already talked about the bezel action. Definitely, you know, that sticking leaf spring on this particular one, as well as um, just the uh, uh, the action as far as the, the play uh, that that has. Certainly, they need some attention there. I'm not a huge fan of the choice to go with a C3. While I like the loom accent for it, I don't love the like greenish color that, that gets. I probably wish they would have gone with a BGW9 uh, for the bezel as well to keep that loom color of the white like they have on the dial. As far as um, contrast, with this particular version I said we would revisit, you can see the choice of an orange GMT hand against that already kind of orangish dial. And then same thing with the second hand accent tip. I think they could have gone with better contrast uh, choices. Even if they had gone with a black hand, um, I think that would have been easier to, uh, to see than this orange against the orangish dial. The um, end link, you know, one of the things here, and I've talked about this several times before, I am not crazy about when they do female end links and have a drop like this. As you can see, it gets a ledge to it. So putting it 
the way that it normally would be on wrist, you get that drop down ledge, which I don't think is very aesthetically pleasing. To me, if you're going to do this, you have to have it higher set in the end link to be able to visually kind of clean that up. Otherwise, I just think it looks a little bit unfinished. The uh, bracelet taper, you know, this is coming in at uh, with a two millimeter taper, so 22 millimeters down to 20 millimeters at the clasp. I probably wish they would have gone a 22 to 18. Not only would that have helped to bring the weight down, but I just think visually it would have been a little more um, balanced. And I think the same thing is true on wrist, though I haven't found this to be un, uh, unbalanced either. And then finally, especially at the retail pricing, I wish they would have had a toeless micro adjust clasp. That's definitely something um, that I think would have elevated this overall packaging for it. At the $369, I think it's definitely much more forgivable. At the retail price of $469, you can get a lot of other watches that do have have the Tolis micro clasp. So that's something I would have liked to have seen that upgrade. So where does that leave us? You know, ultimately, as we've talked about here, it certainly is not a perfect offering in this prototype form, but I definitely think that it has pretty good potential overall. If you're looking for a good everyday dive style GMT, I think this one is going to be a nice, totally stout, robust option that you're going to be able to beat up, not terribly expensive, and it's going to have loom that absolutely blows you away. This thing is, uh, is like a torch here with that full loom dial. So hopefully this has helped in your decision. If you did like it, as always, give that like button a tap. If you haven't already done so, smash that subscribe button. Finally, drop me a comment. Let me know what you think. Which of the three is your favorite? Are there any of the things that are too problematic for you? All that kind of good stuff. Thanks for watching.